Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Hengdal Chitta. We'll begin by hearing again a, a little bit about our intrepid Dharma warrior Sid on his endless journey to enlightenment. Sid is wandering around and has been fortunate enough that one of his uh, devotees has gifted him a, a large bag of crunchy granola. So Sid is on his, his Dharma walk and he's clutching this sack of granola and he's thinking it's very difficult to carry this, this bag with him like this. It's, it's kind of cumbersome, but he you know, doesn't want to get rid of it. He, he needs it. So as he's walking, he's, he's you know, meditating and he's keeping his mind open to see things, to have ideas. And, and he sees a two by four laying alongside the road and there's some nails kind of sticking up in the ends. And he thinks, you know, that, that might just work. So he attaches the bag to, to one end of the two by four, kind of latching it onto a nail and kind of holds it over his shoulder and balances it. And he's walking, but it's still it's still kind of cumbersome. It's it's not as easy. And so he thinks I, I need a counterbalance for this. So he, he keeps his eyes open and he keeps looking and he finds a, a plastic grocery sack by the side of the road. And ah, perfect. So he takes his two by four and he attaches the grocery sack on the other end and he scoops up a bunch of gravel and rocks and stuff from the side of the road and he kind of gets a counterbalance and now he's he's got this two by four across his shoulders like a yoke and he's got a good balance going and so that, that makes it a little easier but you know he's he's walking and you know it's tipping a little bit and the, the grocery sack is tearing and some gravel is falling out and so he keeps stopping to refill the gravel to keep the weight right and Finally, a, a kindly woman notices him walking by and says, you know, there, there's a couple of metal pails right over here. And maybe if you use the pails instead of the sacks, they, they wouldn't give you so much trouble. And well, that's an even better idea. So Sid goes over and he kind of hangs a pail on each end of his two by four, you know, kind of bends the nails over them. And then he puts the granola on one side and his rocks on the other. and He's got his balance. It's good. It's getting a little heavier, but it's it's good, you know. It's rubbing his back of his neck a little bit, but he's walking along and he and he sees a, a little statue of the Buddha, a little clay statue, and he thinks, "Oh, that's perfect. I I need that." So he's trying to figure why I have these pails, and there's more room in them than just the granola and the rocks, and he doesn't really want to put the clay statue over with the rocks, so he puts it over on the side of the granola so it won't get damaged, but then he needs some more rocks on the other side. So he kind of evens himself out again and keeps walking, and he's, he's just trudging along with his yoke over his shoulders, hanging on to all this stuff, and, you know, it's balanced, but it's getting pretty heavy, and he might have a splinter in the back of his neck by now. So I think you get where we're going here. We will fill up both of the pails and then maybe we'll hang some streamers off the two by four and tie some things off to the streamers. We talk about upadana, grasping, which is the, the leading to becoming. It's the attachment. It's the fuel that the fires of our attachment burn on. And we talk a lot in Zen and Buddhism about attachment as a cause of suffering, as, as a root of greed, of clinging. But we always talk about it in reference to what we're losing. You know, we, we talk about it in reference to old age, sickness, and death. We're, we're attached to our youth. We're attached to our health. We're attached to our, our well-being. Uh, as many of us in the Sangha know uh, pretty directly lately, the health thing is fleeting away from many. We're attached to our loved ones, our jobs, our homes. We're attached to all our future plans that, you know, 
we're going to retire and our home's going to be paid off and we're just going to go fishing and meditate and everything's going to be cool someday. And so we always talk about these things, but there's, there's a part of attachment that we often forget. And it's interesting that we don't talk about this much because it was so important in traditional Buddhism that in the Dhammapada, the very first section, which is often translated as pairs, it's the contrasts, the very first section of the Dhammapada on the third stanza, he abused me, he struck me, he overpowered me, he robbed me. Those who harbor such thoughts do not still their hatred. We don't talk about that attachment a whole lot. That leads to a whole lot of suffering. That's the fuel that keeps a whole lot of fires burning because we, we really do cling to that. You know, when you're a child and, and you, you fall down in the playground, at least the playgrounds we had when we were kids, they, they weren't padded with, with rubber rocks and things. Uh, you know, you you wouldn't show that off, you know, hey, look at this, I got 17 stitches in my arm falling off the jungle gym onto the gravel. Or you wrecked your dirt bike, you showed that off, or you broke your wrist or your elbow and you had the cast and you, that was a badge of honor, you, you showed off the scars and you showed, you know, everybody signed the cast and you really showed that off when you're a kid. But as adults, we, we really keep showing that off, we just change how we show it off. It's my anger. I have a right to it. You hurt me. That person over there insulted me. It's mine. I'm right. I have a right to be angry. I have a right to be hurt. I have a right to be insulted. I'm bitter. We really hang on to that. We cling to it. We become it. We allow it to become us. That's a serious attachment. That's the attachment that leads to wars. That's the attachment that leads to shooting. That's the attachment that takes some of the most beautiful people we know and turns them angry and bitter, even if they're not attached to, to youth or health. It's all those slights, those perceived little insults. The guy that cut me off at the corner the coworker that dumped something on my desk six months ago, and I still hate him about it. Those are the things that fuel the fire. More than anything else, and we think we have a right to them. We think we're justified in them. I wear my suffering as a badge of honor, and it's, it's funny because... This is talked about in a lot of other traditions. I, I think about in the Bible when Jesus talks about going out to face the world when you're fasting. And he says, don't cover yourself in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes, but wash your face and go out smiling. If what you're doing is say, hey, look at me, look at how profoundly I'm suffering, you're attached to it. You're clinging to it. You're not letting it go. So what do we say to that attachment? What do we say? And, and a lot of times it's perceived. It may not even be intentional. I love that old story. You know, the, you're in a canoe and you're out in the water and you're all zoned out and another boat bumps into you and you, you get really angry and you start yelling and then you realize the other boat's empty and it just drifted into you. Well, who's there to be angry at? So what do we do with that? What do we do with that attachment? Well, we take our friend Sid and we say, you know what? Why don't you set down that yoke for a minute and take all of those rocks and pile them along the side of the road in the biggest stupa you can make with whatever you've been carrying around with you and lean that yoke up against the side of it and set that beautiful statue of Buddha on top of it and bow to it and walk on down the road and leave it there. 
And then we go to verse four of pairs. He abused me. He struck me. He overpowered me. He robbed me. Those who do not harbor such thoughts still their hatred. 